May I also begin by welcoming the Security Council's unanimous decision in relation to a 30-day ceasefire in Syria, which came after intense lobbying by our Secretary General and others. And we applaud Sweden and quit for their leadership in the Security Council on this. We insist on its full implementation without delay. However, we have every reason to remain cautious as airstrikes on eastern Ghouta continue this morning. Resolution 2401 must also be viewed against a backdrop of seven years of failure to stop the violence, seven years of unremitting and frightful mass killing. Eastern Ghouta, the other besieged areas in Syria, Ituri and the Kassais in the DRC, Taiz in Yemen, Burundi, northern Rakhine in Myanmar, have become some of the most prolific slaughterhouses of humans in recent times because not enough was done early and collectively to prevent the rising horrors. Time and again, my office and I have brought to the attention of the international community violations of human rights which should have served as a trigger for preventive action. Time and again, there has been minimal action. And given this is my last uh, address as High Commissioner at the opening of a March session, I wish to be blunt. Second, to those who are criminally responsible, those who kill and those who maim, the responsibility for the continuation of so much pain lies with the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. So long as the veto is used by them to block any unity of action when it is needed the most, when it could reduce the extreme suffering of innocent people, then it is they, the permanent members, who must answer before the victims. France has shown commendable leadership among the P5 in championing a code of conduct on the use of veto. The United Kingdom has also joined the initiative, now backed by over 115 countries. It is time for the love of mercy that China, Russia, and the United States join them and end the pernicious use of the veto. Some states view human rights as of secondary value, far less significant than focusing on GDP growth or geopolitics. While it is one of the three pillars of the UN, it is, not, it is simply not treated as the equal of the other two. The size of the budget is telling enough and the importance accorded to it often seems to be in the form of lip service only. Many in New York view it condescendingly as that weak emotionally or weak emotion, emotional Geneva-centered pillar not serious enough for some of the hardcore realists in the UN Security Council. Today, oppression is fashionable again. The security state is back, and fundamental freedoms are in retreat in every region of the world. Shame is also in retreat. Xenophobes and racists in Europe are casting off any sense of embarrassment, like Hungary's Viktor Orban, who earlier this month said, and I quote, we do not want our color to be mixed in with others, end quote. Do they not know what happens to minorities and societies where leaders seek ethnic, national, or racial purity? When an elected leader blames the Jews for having perpetrated the Holocaust, as was recently done in Poland, and we give this disgraceful calumny so little attention, the question must be asked, have we all gone completely mad? It is accumulating unresolved human rights violations, such as these, and not 
a lack of GDP growth, which will spark the conflicts that can break the world. While our humanitarian colleagues tend to the victims and we salute their heroism and their selflessness, their role is not to name or single out the offenders publicly. That task falls to the human rights community. That is our task. For it is the worst offenders' disregard and contempt for human rights which will be the eventual undoing of all of us. And this we cannot allow to happen.